just as also you were called of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, if you've kept up count, right? Got one more to go. One God and Father of us all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Boy, that just covers about everything you got to say. Over all, through all, and in all. Now, if you kept up with the ones, we got seven. We have talked about the one body. Today we talked, last week we talked about the one spirit. I've got to talk about it again today. And I'm going to talk about it next week. Because the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the key to the church age. It's one of the keys. The, under the new covenant, you have two members of the Godhead who make an appearance on earth in the word coming or advent. Under the new covenant, there are two members of the Godhead who make an advent into the earth, into the world. We have the first coming of Christ. We call that the advent, the first coming of Christ, and then we look for him to come a second time. There's the first advent. He comes to earth through the Virgin Mary, uh, goes to the cross, dies, buried, raised, and ascends back to the Father, and he's coming again. The second advent of the second member of the Godhead, or the, another member of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the second member of the Godhead that makes an appearance upon the earth is the Holy Spirit. And that advent is as big as the advent of Christ to the plan of God. And we give little, we give little nod to it. And when did the advent of the Holy Spirit come? It came at Pentecost. That's obvious. We live in the dispensation of the ministry, the advent ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's who we are connected with. The second, the, we call him the third member of the Godhead, but it's the second member of the Godhead who's made an appearance, an advent to the earth for a period of time, which is a key period of time. It goes from Pentecost to the second coming of Christ. That's the advent of the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was a big, big deal. I don't know that we make that big a deal of it, but we should. Because our entire ministry of our life comes through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I'm spending a little more time on this one spirit uh, than I might to something else. Because this is the ministry that has impacted my life enormously. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. So we're looking at that. Last time, I did an introduction to the one spirit. Identified him. I identified his essence as that, as a member of the God, Godhead. And we talked about the essence of God in the Holy Spirit. Listen, you know why that's important? Because the Holy Spirit lives inside your body. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, he lives inside your body. He lives inside your body. And so that's a, that's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big deal. So what we're going to take a look at is the ministry. I want to look at nine characteristics of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Last week I introduced you to one. Last week, I introduced one of the nine, what I call earmarks, or the big, what I would consider really important ministries of the Holy Spirit to our lives. He came to earth to live in us and to minister through us. And so, last week, we talked about the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, I can't tell you how important it is. You should, you should memorize the nine fruits of the Spirit so that when the Holy Spirit manifests them to you and through you, you can be where he's doing it, not you. You cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit in the flesh. That's why they're called the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> and it's not plural. 
even though there are nine, it's considered singular. The fruit. Hey, well, come on in here. That's all right. It's about taking care of baby. I know. Uh, it's, and listen, it's for the next 25 years. Yeah, it's a, if you're lucky. If you're lucky. So we're in Ephesians. There should be a Bible uh, next to you. There you go. Uh, Ephesians, we're in Ephesians 4, uh, 4 through 6. Now, here, here's, what, here's what Paul is trying to teach us, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Hey, Rick, thanks. Here's what he's, he's going to do. He's going to tell you, listen to me now. He's going to tell you, Billy, and you know this, but he's going to tell you not, he's going to tell you the seven things, seven doctrines that separate the Christian church from the religions of the world. That's what he's doing because he's the missionary's missionary. The apostle Paul is the missionary's man. If, you, if you're going to go to the mission field, you're going to really want to know, study Paul. Paul is the guy. He's the missionary's missionary. So what, what Paul is interested in, because he was sent to the Gentiles who were just loaded up. He wasn't sent to the Jew. He was sent to the Gentiles who all had religions when they got, when he got, he never went anywhere. There wasn't a religion already there. Paul never went anywhere, even if he went to an island. If he had, was shipwrecked and wound up in an island, he found some kind of goofy religion there. And over his ministry, he realized seven doctrines that separate the Christian church in the world from religion. And these are the seven doctrines. So we're going over them. We think that's important for you to understand that. So that's why our lesson is moving in the direction it is. So today we're going to look at four additional characteristics of the ministry of the advent of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and um, so you're going to need your Bibles because we're going to look up scriptures. You know, I gave you scriptures, but I didn't write them out for you. I'm going to tell you some of the things that I find important about them. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump into our morning study. Let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. If you're aware of it, because the Holy Spirit lives in you, if you're aware of it, you've grieved him, you've quenched him, and he wants you to confess your sins so that you can get back with him who, who is still indwelling you, but he's not in charge of your life. You've allowed your flesh to be in control. You need to get out of the flesh and get back into the spirit. You do that by confessing your sin. According to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. For those who are watching with, by, uh, by internet tonight, today, I encourage you to do the same thing that we're asking the people who come by automobile. We're asking them to do this so that the Holy Spirit can minister the truth of the Word of God's lesson today to your soul. So we, we expect that from you, even if you live in a foreign country. If you've understood what I've said, then we expect you to do that. And so, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God as He has been promised to do for us in His advent, that He will teach and recall to our remembrance the truth of the Word of God is declared by Jesus Himself in John 14, 26, and 27. And we thank you, Father, for what we're about to discover today that will revolution change our life in a dramatic way because of the advent of the Holy Spirit who resides who resides inside our body, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, the first one I want to look at today is an effective prayer life. There is no such thing as an effective prayer life without understanding the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. The key about the indwelling Holy Spirit to have an effective prayer life is you must walk in the Spirit. In Galatians 5.16, he says, walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. He, James goes on and he says, look, you can't pray in the flesh and expect to get a spiritual answer. You got to pray in the spirit to get a spiritual answer. And why else would you pray if you didn't want a God to intervene in your life and do something special? Uh, something special by your request. So he talks about an effective prayer life. You will have no effective prayer life 
if you don't understand how the Holy Spirit works in your life in regard to prayer. So here we are. We're looking at Romans. So turn in your Bibles to Romans with him. We're in Ephesians, so we're going to back up a, a couple books, and we're going to go to Romans, the eighth chapter. This is, I'm giving you landmark passages. I, I want you to put your eyes on it. I want you to put your eyes on the Word of God. Watch. He starts out by saying, in the same way. In the same way, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit also helps our weakness. What does he mean in the same way? I mean, I'm starting a, pa a verse, and it says, in the same way. All right. And he's, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit. In the same way, the Holy Spirit. So when we look at the, when we look at the greater context of our passage, we look up at verse 16. So look up at verse 16 because he's going to talk about the Holy Spirit in the same way the Holy Spirit. So look at verse 16. Watch this now. Because he's, he, this is what he's referring back to. Now, the whole chapter 8 is about the Holy Spirit. But the one he just got talking about is what we're going to look at. The, the last one he talked about before we got to, to our, our verse down in verse 26 is up here when he, when he talks about the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If children of God, verse 17, if children of God, and, and we are if we believe the gospel, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we have suffered him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And then he goes into suffering and connects it to creation and all of that down to verse 25. All of that is down into verse 25. And then he says, in the same way, in the same way. In other words, the ministry of the Holy Spirit that lives inside you, ministering to you like crazy. The Holy Spirit is ministering to your soul and your life like crazy. Verse 16 tells us that. It says, the spirit witnesses with our human spirit that we are children of God. And what does that mean? It means that for children, we're heirs. And he goes on to discuss that and how important it is. Because when we suffer, we understand, we understand that we are suffering undeservedly. We, we are suffering for the, for the cause of Christ. We are suffering for the cause of Christ. And listen, we're not alone in our suffering. The Holy Spirit is there, and he has a ministry to our human spirit in the greatest moments of our suffering, whether it be mental or physical or, or financial or whatever the suffering is. The Holy Spirit is there to bring us comfort. In fact, the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16, one of the, one of the nomenclatures given to him is the word comforter, paracletus. He's called the comforter, the helper, the comforter. And so he says, in our verse, he says, in the same way, the, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. Not just, the, not just in our suffering is he there to bring comfort to us and, 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 and work with us through the plan of God and why God would allow this suffering to come to your life. But listen, he says, he is also there to help our weaknesses for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the, whole, but the Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf with groaning too deep for words. You know, groaning too deep for words is great conflict. Would you agree? Would you find somebody that is groaning too deep for words? You got somebody in a, in a world of hurt. Groaning too deep for words? And this is part of a prayer. When we're, we're groaning, when we're in adversities, Job was there. Job was too deep for words. He couldn't grab a hold of what is going on in my life. Is this why I got saved? What is going on? And his suffering sometimes just put him in places where you just couldn't, you couldn't explain it. It was too, 
it was too deep for words. It was too much. Too deep. It was like drowning. Do you know what? Listen to me. In that deep hour of your life, for sure you're not alone. Not just because God said he would never leave you nor forsake you, but he's put the third member of the Godhead in your life to, to intercede for you in your prayer life when you're so deep into something that is so despairing that you just can't find words adequate to explain what your needs are. That's called weakness. Not only, listen to me. Not only, not only will, not only will God never leave you nor forsake you. He will drop into the deepest parts of your misery, the deepest parts of your emotional stuff. When you cry out to God and you just don't know how to really express what you are feeling in the depths of your soul, in the muck and the mire of it, not only is he with you, he intercedes for you. When words are not able to come and express how bad you feel about God or how good you feel about it. I just can't get there. You have dropped into a very weak state of being able to express adequately. On the one hand, not to be offensive. On the other hand, I don't know what to say. And the Holy Spirit who lives in you is not there just to abide with you, but to take action for you in that moment. Think about that. To take, he's there to take action for you. He intercedes on your behalf when words cannot properly express it for whatever reason in your soul. Groaning too deep for expression. He expresses it for you. That's his job. He intercedes. Listen to me. For we do not, when we do not know how to pray as we should, the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings that are too deep for words. He intercedes for us in that moment. He intercedes for us. And he who searches the heart, watch this, watch the two no's, K-N-O-W. Watch this now. Don't miss this. For God, who searches the hearts, for God, who searches the hearts, see, this is where that groaning business, who searches the hearts, first know, knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because the mind of the Spirit and the mind of God are one. Always. God the Father, look, Jesus, Jesus said, the Father and I are one. We are of one mind. The church is to be of one mind. God and Christ are of one mind. God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always of one mind. They're never divided on issues. They're always of one mind. God, who understands the mind of the Holy Spirit, who is trying to understand the mind of the believer, are now working in conjunction. Watch this now. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints. You see, working with the saint's mind who is struggling, he intercedes on his behalf and tells God what's on the mind of the person who is struggling to kind of express it. God understands the mind of the Holy Spirit 
they're one of one mind, so the Holy Spirit takes your thoughts, which are difficult to find expression, either because you're mad at God or you're glad with God either way. And he's, he intercepts, he brings the clarity of what your intent is before the throne of God in prayer that you're struggling with out of your weaknesses. Paul said, is that, is that at this moment that you will find the strength of God as you've never known it? Power perfected in weakness. You know, that's 2 Corinthians 12. Power perfected in weakness. If you could understand this, if you could grab this, it would revolutionize your life. You're going to go through your struggles. You live in the devil's world. <laughs> you're, you're made of flesh. Flesh and the world go together. Spirit and God go together. That's what separates us from the world. You've got to learn that. If you don't learn that, your life is going to be a tough road, and it don't have to be doesn't have to be this way. It does not have to be this way. And so he tells us about that. In the, and he says, once you come to understand how that works, then verse 28 is going to be dynamite. He says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to a purpose. See, verse 28 has meaning to your life when you understand 26, 27. It won't. It'll just be, it'll just be a, a vague saying to your life. It won't have the dynamics it's supposed to have. Because you see, verse 28 works off 26, 27. That's, that's listen, L look, look. And we know. That's the third no. <laughs> Come on now. I said, pay attention to the no's. And I said, there's two of them. The word no, now he gives you the third time. And we know. The Father and the Holy Spirit know. You need to know they know. And now you need to bring that, that know into your life practical application. Bring that knowledge that you have that God will always work you in the deepest time of your life, in the greatest struggle of your life. When you go like, I'm too weak to get out of bed. I'm too weak to go another day. I'm too weak to do this or do that. That's okay. I just can't tell you. Well, tell me how you felt. I don't know. I just don't know. The words can't express it. The Holy Spirit, that's when he shines. That's when he shines. That's when intercession shines. Intercession shines. And he brings you to the last or the great th third, you know, which gives you great peace. You know that God, verse 28, causes everything to work for good. Well, so prayer is a very important thing. Here's another one I like. I like 1 Thessalonians. I don't know if we'll, where we'll get today. I'm just all over. So don't worry of whether we're going to get through all these because we'll get as far as we need to go. If you'll stay with me long enough, we'll get there. 1 Thessalonians. Here's the fifth chapter. I love this verse. This, this verse is another one of those verses dealing with the Holy Spirit that revolutionized my life as a Christian. Verse uh, 17 and 18. You have no idea what a privilege it is to have verse 17 available. You see, under the old covenant, the Jews, they prayed four times a day. They had set times to pray. That, that a meeting with God. Prayer time with God. Not us. We have access to the throne of grace in time of need any time of the day. So he says, you know what privilege we have? Pray without ceasing. Do you do that? Pray without ceasing. I don't get up in the morning and pray one time. At the, I don't begin my day with prayer and end it with prayer, although I do. I pray all day long. 
as soon as my feet, as soon as my feet hit the floor, I engage in prayer and I pray all day long. I don't stay in a state of prayer. I stay in a state of emergency for prayer. Did you hear me? My prayer, my prayer door, door is always open in my life. No matter what I come across. I have the privilege because of the indwelling Holy Spirit to intercede on my behalf. And because I live in the church age under the new covenant, I have, the, I have access to the throne of grace to discuss anything that crosses my path any time of the day, any moment. So I keep my prayer door open. And when something crosses my path, I need prayer. I just pop it. It's a wonderful thing. I don't have no set time of prayer. My, I just set prayer on ready. And it runs on ready all day long. Do you know what a privilege that is? You have no set time to pray. You can pray anytime you want. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 16, you have access to the throne of God and you can talk to your daddy anytime. You can, you can pick up the phone and talk to your heavenly daddy any time of the day that you want to and have access. You have privilege. You're a member of the royal family. You have privilege. Pray without ceasing. Then he says this. Watch this. Listen to what he says. Pray without ceasing. Watch this. Watch this now. In everything... Pray without ceasing, and when you pray, and you'll pray a lot of times during, during the day, phone call, and all of a sudden you pray. You, you pray all the time, which means you're available for prayer all the time. If I'm driving down the road and I see an accident, I pray for him. Pray without ceasing. Watch this now. Watch this. In everything, talking about prayer, in everything give thanks. Oh, you know, we would like to say in some things, you don't expect me to give thanks in everything. Now, I, I tell you, I understand your argument, but he says in everything. The good, bad, and the ugly. Well, you think I'm supposed to give thanks when, yeah, I don't know. I'm just delivering the mail. He says, in everything, give thanks. Think about that. The doctor says, you go in, you've had this kind of, <coughs> in my head. Um, and he goes, well, you got wanga ganga. And he said, was well, there any cure for it? And he goes, like, we don't have any. Well, give me a moment. I want to give thanks to my heavenly father. There'd be an experience for a doctor. Can we just pause for a moment? Pray without ceasing. Can we just pause for a moment, doctor, before you give me any more news? Can we just pause? Because I want to give thanks for the news I just received. Do you want to give thanks for I just told you you got Wanga Ganga and there's no cure for it? Yeah, because you see, I've already been released from Adam's sin. There was no cure for it except for God. <laughs> Anything else that crosses my plate, that's a piece of cake with frosting. Maybe a little piece of ice cream next to it. You can tell I'm getting hungry. All my metaphors are ice cream and cake. In everything, give thanks. Watch this now. Watch this. You know why you do it? For this is the will of God. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Because God don't let anything pass across your plate that he hasn't signed off on that's not beneficial to your life. Nothing. I hear people, oh, if I didn't have this, I could do that. Are you kidding me? What kind of foolishness is that? Here's one, 1 John. Let's go to 1 John. Yeah, I don't, I don't care how far I get. I just want you to get information. 
Here is 1 John. Of course, you, you're familiar with that. 1 John 5, talking about prayer now. We're talking about prayer. 1 John 5. Come in here. Revelation, 1 John. How come I'm missing 1 John? Come on. 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. Fifth chapter, of course, it'd be in the fifth chapter. I turn the first. Fifth chapter, 1450. Here we go. This is the confidence. That's a powerful word. This is the confidence that we have before him. That's, you know, that's Hebrews 416, how we get to go to the throne any time of the day, any time. Listen, he wants you there. He wants you to tell him. The Holy Spirit will intercede. Don't worry about it. He'll intercede. This is a confidence we have before him. Now watch this. If we ask anything according to his will, he does what? Now, now get this. What does he? This is a promise from God Almighty. What's he do? He hears you. But you got to ask according to what? Now how are you going to know what the will of God is? The word. The word takes you to the will. The will takes you to the work. If you ask anything according to his will, here's his promise. I will listen to you. He'll listen to you because the Holy Spirit is under the command of the Father to bring the information properly before him according to the will of God. Agreed? He kind of cleans it up. He cleans your prayer up. Well, God, I don't know exactly where in the Bible is, but this I know. He go, I buy that. I'll take that. The Holy Spirit, you, you, have, you know where it is. Yes, Father. It's a yada yada. Here it goes. This is a confidence. Confidence, confidence, confidence. This is confidence we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's number one. Watch the word no. Watch the word no. It's going to be used twice. Watch the word no. Because this is what you've got to know. This is what you've got to know. All right? Confidence. Confidence and two times no. Confidence to, to no, no, K-N-O-W. Here's the confidence. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, and we do if we ask according to the will of God, because he wrote it to tell us. Here we go. That's the first we know. Then we know that we have the request, plural, which we have asked from him. This beats Santa Claus' list. Oh, God, I would like it. Put it. Well, put it down, honey. I would like it. Put it down, honey. Put it down, honey. The plurality have requests. Well, I'd like it. I'd like to have it. Too deep, groaning too deep for words. I just illustrated. I do a lot of stuff for you to try to get this stuff. We know. Here's confidence connected to what we know. I have confidence because I know. I have confidence because I know. I have confidence because I know that when I ask anything according to his will, he hears me. He hears me. And if we know that he hears us, what, what we ask and we do, we have, we know that we have the request, plural, which we have asked from him. You can take that to the bank. There's confidence in prayer life. But you got to know the will. It all starts with the will of God. You got to know the will of God. You're going to make a request you want. He's got to hear you. If he hears you and it's the will of God, he's obligated himself to give you a request in the plurality of it. Don't you love that? You should. That's getting a whole bunch of paychecks at one time that you can go deposit and write checks off them. Here's one. James. Let's go over here to James 1, 6, 7, and 8. Let them ask in faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Okay? That's the confidence we have. If we ask anything according to his will. James approaches it this way. 
He said, he said, let him ask in faith without any doubting. Here's what I grew up. Here's what people would say when I was a kid growing up. Don't open that can of worms. No, I, I don't know. I, I'm hoping that they're talking about a can of worms to fish with. And not a can of soup that's turned into worms. You know? So when I hear that, I think of a kid who used to go out and dig up these worms and go fishing with a cane pole. But whatever that illustration was, it wasn't ever good to open a can of worms. So I guess that was a bad thing to do. Doubting. See, doubting is the opposite of confidence. Doubting. You know, doubting Thomas. Poor guy got a good guy. has one slip there, and now he's called Doubting Thomas for the rest of his life. <laughs> It's kind of like a little kid who names you. you got, people will say, well, I hear you're going to have a grandchild. Oh, yeah. What do you want them to call you? Forget it. They'll call you with whatever, whatever name they want, and it'll stick with you your entire life. Even when they're 40 years old, they'll come back and call you by that name. That's Right? I mean, you can say what you want. You can try to tell them, but listen, once that kid blurts something out and grandma or grandpa shines out and goes like, oh, baby, knows me, it's over. It's over. And so you, you get a, let him doubt, let him ask in faith without any doubting because God, God will honor his promise, Romans 4.21. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the winds. Let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded person, he is unstable in all of his ways. See, it's a good sign to you when you ask of God in doubt. It's an so internal sign of a, a rotten belief. You have a rotten belief. Did you see that? You're not going to get it. If you doubt, he's going to give it to you. I mean, who has ever taken pictures of me? I'd like to have you quit that. Vanity, vanity, I said. Well, anyhow, uh, let me try one more before we go home. I'm moving right on this one. Indwelling. I love this one. I like them all, don't I? I said, I thought, I love this one. Eh. First Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verse 19, 20. I told this to the kids at camp this week. I had a little girl from Georgia. She lit up like a Christmas tree. You could see her say to her in her mind, you could hear her say, do you mean the Holy Spirit lives inside my body and my body is the temple of God? You could see her. She read it back in her eyes to me. I could see it. I could see her going like, who do I? And her light, the lights on her eyes got bright. You know, they were dim. Then they, she, have you ever seen that? A person has got the, the lights are in dim. Then they, you, they click with something from the word of God and they, they flash their bright light. <laughs> I love seeing that. Every once in a while I see it in here. Every once in a while. He says, do you not know? Do you know how many times the word no is used in the Bible? And when you hear it, when you walk away, you should say, "I now I know that. Right? Do you not know that your body, talking to a believer, that your body is the temple, that's the naos, that's the holy of holies, that your body is the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Now, here's what the kids balk at. 
Verse 20 is what they bulk at. Their lights go on bright. Woo! I've been dwelt by the Holy Spirit, and my body's the temple of God. Yeah, it's a mobile church. This is the part of the verse, the lights go back to dim. <laughs> they dim them down. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. They go back on dim. <laughs> you know when your body was bought? The moment you believed that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, he took possession. He bought your body, put the Holy Spirit in it, who can never leave you. John 14, 16, he can never leave you. There's your security of your salvation. He can never leave you. Never leave you. He can never leave you. Never. Think about that. Never leave you. And as a result of that, purchasing your body through the death on the cross and the coming of the Holy Spirit, the moment you believe the gospel of Christ, your body became, your body, your human body became the naos, the holies of holies of God because of the blood of Christ. And you have a permanent present dwelling with God. And your body is no longer your own. I said to them, you know, as a pastor of many, many years, it's interesting to me. He indwells a little fat guy. He don't say, well, you're going to have to lose about 30, 40 pounds for me to come in. <laughs> I mean, this is way... Never says that. He doesn't, doesn't walk up to a short person and go like, well, you know, you're only a, you ought to at least be 5'8". No. He doesn't walk up and say, well, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty short. How tall are you? Mm. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a little wee man was he. Nicodemus, uh, come over here, Zachariah. Come over here. Let me indwell you guys. I don't care if you're six feet or three feet. It's not an issue whether you're tall or small or fat or thin or bald headed or long hair or short hair or bark or whatever you do. Well, I shouldn't bark. You shouldn't bark. I mean, I think sometimes you don't realize it because he saves you and he takes you just like you are and he buys your body. He buys your body. He doesn't care. Look, he doesn't care. Your body, you know where your body's headed? To the dust. From the dust it came to the dust it returns. And God don't, get, God don't, God don't look at you and go like, well, look, I'd marry you, but... No, none of that. Well, I've got a lot of scars on my body and my soul and everything. I don't care. Look at it. I, I clean them all up. I cleanse them. It's okay. It's just a wonderful thing. God indwells your body, and we, we spend so much time in America uh, about this body stuff. Listen, do what you want with it. Just don't get crazy with it. But listen, none of it has to do with the Holy Spirit. He steps into your presence, loves you, does all of his ministry, and he never complains whether you're th short or tall or fat or skinny. Quit doing that stuff. Enjoy your life. Let the Holy Spirit minister your soul and your spirit. I mean, whether you're too skinny or too fat is just could be health issues, but that's the most it could be is a health issue. 
somebody says to you, well, you know, I would date you, but you're about 40 pounds too heavy. You need to walk our way. My point is this. God bought you, loves you just the way you are. You want to change anything, that's up to you, but be sure you don't get crazy about it. Sure, you don't get crazy about it. And don't get down on yourself when you look in the mirror. Just get a different mirror that makes you look good. <laughs> you know, they got them. Don't get a fat mirror. Get a thin mirror if that makes you feel better to look in the mirror and go like, oh, look at it. Get a thin mirror. If, that, if that's what makes you happy, listen, it shouldn't make you happy. It's a health issue, maybe. It's a health issue, but no more than that. It's not a spiritual issue. It's a health issue. I get crazy. Your body is no longer your own. Then they put the, they had the lights on bright, now they put them on dim. Oh, I don't. <laughs> yeah, the next day that guy makes some moves on you, tell him, this body don't even belong to me. Well, who's that body belong to? God. Jesus Christ, there gives you an invitation to talk to a guy who thinks, what do you mean your body's not your own? No, I can't. I can't. No, quit that. I'm not going to do that. This body is not mine. They go like, ooh, 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 ooh. this body's not mine. It's under ownership of God Almighty through the blood of Jesus Christ. My body's not my own. And they just put their lights on dim, make a quick U-turn, and away they go some other place because you're nuts. Yeah, you're nuts for God. Well, we'll come back next week and look at some more of this. Thank you for your patience. You need to pay attention to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in you. You spend so much time beating yourself up about things that are not necessar necessary to beat yourself up over. And in doing all that, you lose the joy of the journey. You lose the joy of the journey. Find the joy of the journey. Let the Holy Spirit minister to your soul and your spirit. So, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. The one spirit, the one spirit that's in everybody who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ. The one spirit. And what does this one spirit do? And that's what we're talking about. All the things that he is there to do for us, to minister to us and through us. We've looked at how effective our prayer life can come because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. how it's changed our body, not just our soul, to be redeemed. How it's changed, how redemption has changed my view of my body. And we learn from this passage about it that, that one day we look for the day of redemption of the body, the resurrection body. What a wonderful day that will be when the temple will be exchanged for the resurrection body. Wow, what an idea that is, Father. Be with our offering, Father, as we take it. We pray that we would be good stewards of it as people have entrusted it to us to reach as far as the ends of the earth with the gospel of Christ and with missionaries. We're thankful to have Billy with us today, Father, and Teresa, for their, their faithfulness to serve you on the foreign field of the Philippines which is now their home, their home. They're fortunate to be able to have a home in two places. When they come to America, they're home. And when they go back to the Philippines, they're at home. Only missionaries have that wonderful sense of belonging. And we're thankful for it. In Jesus' name, amen.